help shorten your uh, cross-examination? Y yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good. Uh, now, um, we, we'd like to uh, move the admission of DIX 1331, which was the document we were just uh, discussing, the Human Rights Campaign Annual Report. Your Honor, I, I just I want to object. I'm a little concerned that at some point, um, cite these documents somehow stating truthful facts, and they haven't called witnesses on these issues, the statements in these documents, their opinion, their hearsay. Uh, I, I don't think we have an objection to judicial notice, so they're available to the court to refer to. But I do object to the, this type of document going into substantive evidence. I understand your position. The witness is being asked about these documents. I think in fairness for um, all parties and the completeness of the record, it's appropriate to admit these. And the testimony is what it is. And um, I realize that uh, these statements are not... Uh, do not necessarily establish the truth of the content, but uh, they certainly provide a basis for the witness's testimony and the witness's uh, cross-examination by Mr. Thompson, so I think it's appropriate. And however they're characterized as either admitted or judicial notice, I think is essentially immaterial. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so uh, we'd like now, with the court's permission, to play a short clip from a speech from President Obama. I'd like you to watch this clip and then react. Well, this is the 20th uh, of January, isn't it? It's the story of the human rights campaign and the fights you fought for nearly 30 years, helping to elect candidates who share your values, standing against those who would enshrine discrimination into our Constitution, advocating on behalf of those living with HIV AIDS, and fighting for progress in our capital and across America. Now, this story, this fight, continues now, and I'm here with a simple message. I'm here with you in that fight. You will see a time in which we as a nation finally recognize relationships between two men or two women as just as real and admirable as relationships between a man and a woman. But we know there's far more work to do. We're pushing hard to pass an inclusive employee non-discrimination bill For the first time ever, an administration official testified in Congress in favor of this law. Nobody in America should be fired because they're gay despite doing a great job and meeting their responsibilities. It's not fair. It's not right. We're going to put a stop to it. And it's for this reason that if any of my nominees are attacked, not for what they believe, but for who they are, I will not waver in my support because I will not waver in my commitment to ending discrimination in all its forms. We cannot afford, we cannot afford to cut from our ranks people with the critical skills we need to fight any more than we can afford for our military's integrity to force those willing to do so into careers encumbered and compromised by having to live a life. So I'm working with the Pentagon, its leadership, and the members of the House and Senate on ending this policy. Legislation has been introduced in the House to make this happen. I will end it, don't ask, don't tell. That's my commitment to you.
Does President, using your definition of a political ally, does President Obama, uh, does he count as a political ally to the gay and lesbian community? Given my uh, concerns about the unreliability of allies and the illustrations I've used, I think pre President Obama is perhaps the best illustration of an ally who cannot be counted upon, an ally whose rhetoric far exceeds his actions. Um, surely you'd agree that there's a difference between giving a nice speech and actually accomplishing some sort of, of policy change. You believe, in fact, that President Obama is at best lukewarm and maybe even indifferent to gay rights, correct? Um, I believe that he has some significant reservations about the issue, particularly on same-sex marriage. He articulated repeatedly during the 2008 campaign that he was not in favor of same-sex marriage. Since his inauguration into office, um, there has been no administrative action on suspending discharges under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. His words notwithstanding, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act is not on its way to final passage. Um, he has, his administration has defended the Defense of Marriage Act uh, in court and continues to do so in multiple lawsuits. When the Prop 8 sister resolution emerged in the state of Maine, um, he, uh, Organizing for America, which is the remnants of his campaign from a year ago, sent emails into Maine asking for them to make calls into the New Jersey and Virginia gubernatorial races, but without a single mention of the same-sex uh, ballot initiative that was on the ballot at the very same time. The same was true for the Washington State Initiative. So in fact, um, most gay activists with whose work I am familiar and the leadership of most gay organizations, with the possible exception of the Human Rights Campaign notably, um, feel that <coughs> President Obama has been particularly disappointing as a erstwhile ally. Now, he, he did sign the hate crimes legislation, correct? He did sign the Defense Authorization Act on which hate crimes was a, an amendment, yes. And then he had a signing ceremony in the Rose Garden, correct? He did. Yes. And uh, in determining whether President Obama was an ally of gays and lesbians, one thing you would look to is whether he has spoken publicly about the adverse treatment of gays and lesbians in society, correct? That's correct, and on that dimension, President Obama is a very good speechmaker. And another factor you would consider in assessing whether President Obama was an ally of gays and lesbians is whether he had introduced legislation on behalf of LGBT political goals, correct? Um, well, strictly speaking, of course, the administration doesn't introduce legislation, uh, but yes, if his administration was working with an, uh, an author on the Hill to submit a piece of legislation that uh, he pledges up front to sign, that would be a positive factor to consider. And he's, he's pledged to sign the Employment uh, Non-Discrimination Act, correct? Um, he, I, he has. Um, I heard the video. Yeah. A and uh, that's passed the House of Representatives, correct? It has. Now, using your definition of ally, Senator Feinstein is only a soft ally of gays and lesbians, correct? Um, I think given her the record over the course of her political career, that's the way I would describe it. And in considering whether gays and lesbians have reliable allies, you would define a reliable ally as one who, when faced with political threat, <coughs> when faced with alternative agenda items, is willing to set aside alternative items and sail into stiff winds in order to act on behalf of gays and lesbians, correct? I think that that would be one aspect I would want to consider. Uh, for example, as the opinion polls in support of the Democratic administration have uh, waned over the course of the last 12 months, uh, the speaker, who as we recall from uh, the earlier question, represents the city and county of San Francisco, the speaker has indicated that particularly controversial social matters, including gay rights issues, that the House of Representatives would not take them up until the Senate acted first. That's an example of um, not wanting to, to sail into stiff winds. Um, 
Another example might be, for example, the setting aside of any question of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell or Defense of Marriage Act issues until after the economy or health care is dealt with, etc. So one of the tropes that people would use to uh, not enact um, protections for gays and lesbians is that there are other priorities or to do so would endanger our coalition behind Bill X or Bill Y. Um, and, and so this is a, a fairly constant refrain that gay and lesbian um, advocacy leaders hear when they're asking for legislation to be moved forward. Now, using your definition of reliable political ally, you're not even sure the ACLU would qualify as a reliable ally, correct? Um, well, um, I'm actually willing to concede that the ACLU is a pretty reliable ally because sailing into stiff winds um, appears to be uh, what they're willing to do. Uh, that's not to say that there's, they've never shrank from uh, an issue they may have, but I think they're probably more reliable than most other groups. But uh, when I asked you during your deposition, and I'd like to direct your attention to, uh, I believe it's tab three of your binder and page 88. We're talking about uh, the definition of reliability on 88 uh, line six. And then towards the end of 88, you, you mentioned that there may be uh, some allies who are willing to pay costs to support gay and lesbian causes. And then when we go to 89, I said, question, well, now, you said very few. Answer, well, I said there could be individuals in my answer. Question, okay. But in terms of large organized forces in the society, maybe the, the American Civil Liberties Union, I don't know. I mean, I'm struggling. I'm sure if I spent all day, I could probably think of an ally or two. And, and you gave that testimony, correct? I did, which I believe is consistent with what I just said, that the ACLU is probably an ally. Yeah. Now, uh, you don't have sufficient information to know whether Speaker Pelosi meets your definition of a reliable ally, correct? Um, I don't have maybe all the pertinent information. I would see her as more likely than not an ally, but the, her level of reliability I would condition by um, her responsibility and desire to protect the Democratic majority and, and perhaps put off controversial votes. Now, and, and that could be a sound strategy even from the uh, perspective of the LGBT community, correct? Um, well, uh, it, that depends. It could be a sound strategy if it creates the opportunity for the majority to live to fight another day. Alternatively, it could be, and, and I think there's some evidence to suggest that um, by delaying uh, certain priorities of core constituencies or groups that you have a long-term representational relationship with, that in fact, on the claim that you, you do so to live to fight another day, that when the next day comes, you're no longer there. And so the, the legislative priority was sacrificed for, for no gain. Um, so I think it remains an open question whether this is a sound strategy or not. All right now let's uh, talk about the importance of the media. The media can be important in terms of figuring out the political power of a group, correct? Its relationship to the media? Um, you'd have to be a little bit more specific, I'm afraid, with respect to which medium you're, you're speaking. Well, television could be important to the way in which a group is portrayed on television could be important. Entertainment to television or news? News. Television news? Yes. Yes, I would say that TV news might be uh, uh, yeah. relevant. Okay, and one of the materials you deemed relevant to this case is a book by John Zoller entitled The Nature and Origins of Mass Opinion, correct? That's correct. And I'd like to direct your attention to tab 23, which has the first few chapters of that book. This is DIX 296. And... Uh, the thesis of Mr. Zoller is that public opinion responds more directly to lead cues than bubbling up from the masses, correct? And that's a fair um, version, yep. And you would agree that he is right in the general sense that the stories that the media covers raises the salience of an issue, correct? Uh, within constraints, yes. There are some issues that, uh, whether the media covers or not, remain present. And then there are some issues that the media might devote a lot of attention to, and even political elites might cue a great deal that the public never buys onto. So it's certainly not a, a perfect relationship. But in general, 
if the media covers a story more more frequently and with greater intensity, the public is likely to respond by thinking it more important. Your Honor, we move the admission of DIX 296. Very well, the IX-296 is admitted. Excellent. And turning to uh, the next tab, uh, Professor, this is an article uh, entitled Minority Group Interests and Political Representation, Gay Elected Officials in the Policy Process, and it's DIX-1102. And, and this was an article uh, you considered? I'm sorry. I, uh, my next tab is a 2005 report by the HRC. Okay, let, let me, um, do, do you, uh, and if the binder is, is missing uh, that information, we can provide that later and, and come Oh, back. I'm okay, so you're under tab A. Y yes, sir. Okay, you, I'm, with you. okay I'm with you. Okay, sorry. Um, and, and this is an article you considered in reaching your opinions in this case, correct? Uh, one of several, yes. All right, and I'd like to direct your attention to page 575 the second paragraph. And, and the article uh, states here, most important gay political representation significantly influences the adoption of domestic partner benefits. However, unlike the registration model, it is not the most influential factor. Instead, elite support has the greatest influence. Is that consistent with the point Zoller is making? Um, it would be consistent, but unless I look at the results directly, I, I'm going to have a tough time giving you um, a sort of specific response to, to the claim. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1102. Well, 1102 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, now, Professor, you would agree that the frequency of media coverage has increased in recent years for issues relating to gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, I would. Um, I'm still grappling with your last question, but um, yes, I would agree that, uh, that, elite, uh, that media coverage is higher. And therefore, the salience or the visibility of the gay and lesbian community, at least on that dimension, has increased, correct? Uh, that's probably true, yes. And I'd like to direct your attention to uh, tab 24. This is the Human Rights Campaign 2005 Annual Report. It's got DIX 1327. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 19 and the pagination appears in the upper right-hand corner of the even pages. We do I not paginate. I see. So are, are you there, sir? Uh, I'm with two? you. Yeah, okay. Uh, and in the second uh, paragraph on page 19, it states, in 2005, our message of fairness has reached 90% of Americans with a quote in at least one newspaper every day, and that would be an indication that the gay and lesbian community is able to get its message out through the media on a regular basis, correct? It would be a claim that the gay and lesbian community can get its message out on a regular basis. Do you have they any basis to dispute that claim? Oh, yes. You don't, you, don't, you don't think that they're getting a quote in the paper once a day? I believe they're getting a quote in the paper once a day. That's, okay, that well, that, that's their claim here. Well, but no, their claim is that 90% of Americans have seen the quote. It, it, it has reached 90% of Americans now. Newspaper readership in the United States is significantly below 50% of the population. So newspaper media is certainly, and, and certainly news stories about gays and lesbians, is not likely to yield a 90% contact rate. Now, does that mean that newspapers serving localities that have 90% of the population have published at least one quote about gays and lesbians? Absolutely. But does it mean that 90% of Americans have been reached with the HRC message? I think we have political advocates, again, advertising their importance. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1327. Very well, 1327 is admitted. 
And uh, during the year and a half that you've lived in this area, you can't recall any editorial from the San Francisco Chronicle that was hostile to the interests of gays and lesbians, correct? I do not read the Chronicle every day, but I would find it unlikely. Yes, but you do read the New York Times, correct? Again, not every day, but I read it a fairly frequently, yes. And in the last 10 years, you don't recall any instance in which the New York Times took a hostile position to the interests of gays and lesbians, correct? I don't recall one. You do recall editorial in the New York Times advocating for the dissolution of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, correct? I do. And advocating for the uh, Employment Non-Discrimination Act, correct? Yes. And I'd like to direct your attention to the next tab, which is DIX 1323, and it's uh, the Human Rights Campaign Annual Report for the year ended March 31, 2000. Um, and turning your attention to page three, which is the fifth page behind the tab, the uh, third paragraph from the bottom, the second sentence states, Reporters and editorial boards view our advocacy as common sense rather than special interest. Is that a true statement that editorial boards uh, view the positions of the uh, gay and lesbian political community as common sense? Um, it's a blanket statement, and like most academics, I'm deeply uncomfortable with blanket statements. I would be willing to represent that it would be my belief, um, my belief in the absence of an analysis that the majority of editorial boards um, um, with some regional variation accounted for uh, probably uh, tend to, to favor some protections for gays and lesbians. I don't believe that's uniform across the issue. So you would have more editorial boards, for example, favoring a hate crimes law than a non-discrimination law and more favoring a non-discrimination law than same-sex marriage, for example. Um, I also think that there would be dramatic variation by region. Um, so there would be parts of the country where this would clearly not be true. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for information to evaluate this, but it strikes me as particularly overbroad. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1323. Very well. 1323 is admitted. And remind me, uh, Mr. Thompson, what page were you looking at? Oh, uh, I was looking at page three, Your Honor. Page? Uh, page uh, three. It's the fifth. We, we Xeroxed the cover, so it's, it's actually the fifth page in the exhibit. But it's marked page three? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Certainly. Um, and now uh, directing your attention, Professor Segura, to tab 26. Uh, this is an editorial from the New York Times dated September 29th, 2008, and it's entitled Preserving California's Constitution. And in the third paragraph, it's, it, and it's addressing Proposition 8, uh, and in the third paragraph, the third sentence says, it is our fervent hope that Californians will reject this mean-spirited attempt to embed second-class treatment of one group of citizens in the state constitution, is it fair to say that the New York Times emphatically supports the rights of gays and lesbians to marry? Um, well, I would certainly conclude from this editorial that they certainly fervently oppose Proposition 8. Um, uh, I would assume, uh, in the absence of a, an editorial to the contrary, that they would extend that to other states as well. All right, and let's turn uh, your attention to tab 33. I'm there. Okay, and this is uh, a document that <clears throat> appeared on the LA Times, one of their blogs, and uh, in the first bullet point under the picture, uh, there's a quote from the LA Times editorial, and it says, uh, it's the same sentence as in 2000, only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. Yet the issue that will be put before voters November 4th is radically different. This time, the wording would be used to rescind an existing constitutional right to marry. We fervently hope that voters, whatever their personal or religious convic 
convictions will shudder at such a step and vote no on Proposition 8. And is this a reflection that the LA Times emphatically supported the no on 8 campaign? Um, it, it would appear to be a reflection of both the LA Times' support for the no on 8 campaign and the fondness for the word fervently in editorials. <laughs> Now, uh, the, uh, the, the, another factor that, uh, per, that uh, is a source of political power is the cohesion and size of a political group, correct? I think that's true. And uh, you believe that 4 to 7% of the U.S. population is openly gay or lesbian, correct? Um, as you and I discussed during my deposition, um, there is a broad scholarly disagreement over the size of the gay and lesbian population. And I believe my answer in deposition is the same one I'll give now, which is that um, it is my belief that the answer is somewhere between 4 and 7 percent based on some marketing polling that I've observed, um, places that are not particularly political, so we tend to get a, a few more honest answers. I've seen numbers as low as 2 and as high as 10, both of which I think to be um, unlikely, sort of too conservative and too too uh, permissive. So I think four to seven is a more accurate estimate, but again, that's based on reading literally dozens of um, stabs at this in both the scholarly and the marketing literature. All right, and in, and that, that doesn't include bisexuals, correct? No, no. With respect to the percentage of the U.S. population that is predominantly bisexual, You've only seen numbers in the neighborhood of 2%, correct? 2% or even less. Uh, but again, that's, a, that's another number that has some definitional problems with it. So um, I know the court heard some testimony um, yesterday on this issue, but um, is a bisexual someone who has only engaged in sex with alternating partners or do we do, do, are we defining it in, with their sexual behavior in the last year or the last five years? So I think that's a that's a little bit more of a porous category, a little bit harder to define. Uh, in terms of cohesion, 23% of gays and lesbians uh, are estimated to have voted in favor of George W. Bush in 2004, correct? Um, that's correct, yep. So in fact, gays and lesbians are much less politically cohesive than African Americans, correct? Um, as a practical matter, it's hard to imagine a single political group that is not less cohesive than African Americans who vote Democratic somewhere between 89 and 95 percent in most elections. So, um, 77 percent voting Democrat and 23 percent voting Republican would be less cohesive than African Americans, uh, a significant uh, degree more cohesive than Latinos and certainly than Anglos. A small group can be politically powerful, correct? Um, it depends on what you mean by group. Are we talking about a, a demographic group here, or are we talking about like an, a, an organization or association? Well, a, a small demographic group can be politically powerful. Uh, the Jewish community is, has a meaningful degree of political power in the United States, correct? Um, I would say that the Jewish community has a meaningful degree of political power uh, based on their representation in public office and their resources, but uh, I'm not sure. I, I haven't undertaken an analysis of that of that community, but that would be my conclusion, at least at the up, without thinking about it a lot. But. And and a small group could be powerful in a closely divided electorate, correct? Well, that's always true. So um, the the closer an election the more likely it is that, that smaller uh, segments of the population can make a difference for a group to, to make a credible claim that they played a role in the outcome of the election. The margin within the group would have to exceed the margin uh, of victory overall. And so when then Senator Obama and Senator Clinton were battling it out for the Democratic primary, they both actively sought the support of the gay and lesbian community, correct? Um, I think it's fair to say that that's true. I think it's also fair to say that in that very close primary contest, they actively sought the support of every person with a pulse and a voter registration card. Cause it's, it's, yes, but they had special attention to the gay and lesbian community because of the uh, financial resources, correct? By special attention, are you suggesting that they 
paid more attention to gays and lesbians than they, they did to other Democratic constituencies? Because I actually don't know that to be true. Well, to anyone with a pulse. In other words, they weren't indifferent. Uh, you just said, oh, well, they wanted everyone with a pulse. Isn't it true that they were more focused on the gay and lesbian community than just anyone with a pulse off the street? I don't have evidence of that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it would certainly be fair to say that both then Senator Obama and Sen then Senator Clinton um, actively courted organized labor, actively courted gays and lesbians, actively courted environmentalists, African Americans, Latinos, etc. Um, it's the term "special" that I'm I'm reacting to. I'm afraid because I, the term "special" appears to suggest that they paid more attention to gays and lesbians than to other Democratic constituencies, and I actually just don't know that to be true. But uh, are the gay and lesbian community is that a Democratic constituency? I think by any measure, it's a, it's a majority Democratic constituency, yes. All right. Now, persuasion can also be a source of political power, correct? Um, that's a, a more complex question. So Dahl speaks about persuasion, and he identifies persuasion as one of the weakest forms of political power. Um, persuasion has multiple components to it, so it is more than merely a group saying, please, pass a piece of legislation for us, or it's the right thing to do. Persuasion in, in, involves, particularly for this instance, the, the need to identify an external, deeply held norm in the society to which you can appeal. So, for example, this society has norms of equality or norms of fairness. And in order for persuasion to be used, what a group would have to do is say, you know, we all believe in equality, we all believe in fairness, those norms should apply to us. And if you apply those norms to us, then you should change your vote and, and, and be persuaded of the rightness of our position. So persuasion actually relies not only on the oratorical skills of the group, but also the degree to which the, uh, the audience um, holds the deeply internalized norms of, about what, what the society thinks and is willing to assign the, include the, the subject group in those norms. It's a much more tenuous undertaking, and, and for that purpose, I think that's why Dahl sees it as the weakest form of power. But, but you would agree a, a group might cajole a legislator by appealing to a societal uh, norm of justice or fairness, correct? I would believe that a group would certainly make the effort and um, may actually yield some number of changed hearts, yes. And the abolitionists in the 19th century were able to make claims on norms of fairness, correct? Um, they were, but I wouldn't look at that as the principal source of power for the abolitionists. Well, you would agree that among the strategies that the black civil rights movement used was an intellectual or idea-based appeal to the internalized national norm of fairness, correct? I believe that that was a strategy, but it would hardly be the, the most important um, or even the most frequently used. Uh, if we per peruse the history of the black civil rights movement, African-American activists fighting for their civil rights engaged in a whole host of strategies, including boycotts of businesses, boycotts of the Montgomery um, bus line, sit-down strikes at southern lunch counters, freedom rides where northerners, northern blacks and northern whites boarded buses and rode into the south to defy the segregation of southern facilities, uh, a strategy that took them into the courts, a strategy that took them into the television sets. Um, serendipity, frankly, played a role. One of the reasons we have the Voting Rights Act is that the, um, the attack by uh, Alabama officials on African-American activists at the Edmund Pettus Bridge happened to be televised live by CBS and spilled into people's living rooms. So there are many more uh, strategies and tactics used by the black civil rights movement. Certainly, the idea of justice played an important role. It was not the only role. And, and gays and lesbians make appeals to the norm of fairness in pursuing their political agenda, correct? Yes, they do. And such appeals to fairness may, in fact, persuade some number of people, correct? They may, in fact, persuade some number of people, yes. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, sources of political power, another would be tactics. The tactics that a group uses can... Uh, have ramifications for the amount of power they have, correct? Um, uh, yes, with the following qualification. Sometimes um, tact you're suggesting that tactics shape how much power a group has, 
And I would think that normally the causal arrow is in the reverse, that how much power a group has really shapes the tactics that they choose. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't put a causal relationship in the way that you're suggesting. Are you, are you saying that tactics are irrelevant to the political power of a group? I did not. I said that, that there was a non-recursive relationship. Well, um, you, you've read uh, press reports suggesting that the no on eight people themselves felt like they did not do a particularly good job on reaching out to blacks and Latinos, correct? Um, I have read reports suggesting that they felt like they had maybe not done the best outreach there, yes. And you have no reason to doubt those reports, correct? I, I don't know enough about the internal organization of the Prop 8 campaign, but I have no reason to question it. All right, now let's talk about how violence uh, pertains to the political power of a group. In the democratic uh, process, violence is usually negatively perceived, correct? That is usually the case, yes. And within a democratic process, violence historically backfires, correct? Um, yes, uh, depending on the willingness of external authorities to, to become involved. So there have been moments, frankly, when violence was effectively used, for example, by segregationists around the turn of the century, the Klan and others, to disenfranchise large numbers of people. So there have been unfortunate moments in our history when political forces have used violence to actually achieve their goals. As a general uh, question, I think I would certainly not favor it, and I think it's a fundamentally anti-democratic thing to do. Sympathy is a tool to help secure political outcomes by seeking to activate internalized norms of fairness and equity, correct? Uh, again, a qualified yes. and. Um, the reason is that certainly um, the audience, in this case the electorate, being sympathetic to your goals or to your personal circumstances is better than them, their being hostile. But the way you say sympathy is a tactic suggests that there's sort of a premeditation that you, the, a particular political force goes out and maybe, um, I don't know, cries, woe is me, on the corner. I, 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 sympathy as a tactic is something I'm having a little bit of trouble wrapping my mind around. Well, if a group is trying to use an appeal to an internalized norm of fairness or equity, the moment it engages in violence, much of that appeal dissipates. Yes or no? Um... Well, again, these are matters of degrees. So it was certainly the case during the Black Civil Rights Movement that there was a very strong emphasis on nonviolence in order to retain the, the, the um, positive support of white Northerners, for example. Uh, so in general, if, you, if the group is enjoying sympathy, then violence could ameliorate that sympathy to some degree. It would depend on how much violence and who it was directed at and the circumstances under which it arose and, and whatnot. Well, I'd like to direct your attention to your deposition in this case and to page 190, line 13. This should appear behind uh, tab 3 in your binder. Yep. Okay. And so uh, if, if we look at uh, page 190, line 13, you said, in the democratic process, violence is usually negatively received. That in some respects, if we go back to your question about ideas, if a group is trying to use uh, an appeal to an internalized norm of fairness or equity, the moment it engages in violence, much of that appeal dissipates. And you gave that testimony, correct? I did. Okay. Um, now, how are you doing on time, Mr. Thompson? Well, Your Honor, uh, I appreciate uh, Professor Segura's fulsome answers. Uh, I'm not getting yes or no answers, so I'm running behind schedule, and I'm afraid there's no possible way that I could finish this evening. Get in another half hour? I I'm happy to, uh, to keep going, Your Honor, absolutely. Um, now, um, 
So uh, one of the political resources that a group may have is goodwill, correct? Uh, correct. All right. Um, and if we're looking at sources or barriers to political power, you'd also want to look to see if a group had been disenfranchised, correct? Uh, yes. All right. And you're not aware of any specific form of intimidation aimed at prohibiting gays and lesbians from voting, correct? Um, with the with the caveat that um, there may have been some number of gays and lesbians who were kept out of the franchise as a consequence of felony charges associated with uh, gay harassment in the 50s and 60s, it is possible under those circumstances that some number of gay and lesbian voters lost their right to vote as a consequence of anti-gay enforcement policies um, in the states. Um, with that caveat, in, in, in the recent sense, there may have been an isolated incidents of intimidation with which I'm not familiar, but I don't know of a concerted effort to drive down the gay electorate. Right. You, you can't point to any such instance, let's say, in the last 30 years of any uh, government official anywhere in the United States targeting gays and lesbians to disenfranchise them so they can't vote, correct? Um, I, I don't have an example off the top of my head, so no, I cannot recall any. All right. Now, uh, let's talk. We, we've talked about the sources of political power. Let's look at some, t talk about some of the indicia of political power. Um, and would you agree that one reflection of political power is a group's ability to convince Congress to allocate funds to issues that are important to the group? Um, Again, uh, with, with the footnote that I would want to see evidence that the group was bringing resources and pressure to bear in order to get Congress to allocate funds that otherwise wouldn't have, yes, that would be a positive outcome that I would want to look at. And in assessing uh, the political power of a group, another factor you would look at would be the presence of statutory protections for their equality, correct? Yes. And you'd also uh, want to look at whether they have the ability to elect candidates of their choice, correct? That would be a measure, yes. All right. And you, you, with respect to the gay and lesbian community, you have not assumed that only a gay or lesbian could be a candidate of choice for the gay and lesbian community, correct? No, I have not. And the voting rights literature has always focused on the notion of first choice without regard to the demographic characteristics of the candidate, correct? That's correct. And in the California legislature, there are four openly gay officials, correct? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that number is correct. And that's out of 120, correct? Um, yes, that's correct. And so that's 3.3 percent, if I'm doing my math right? Um, I'm sorry, I can't do the math that quick in my head, but if you represent that, I'll... Take them. Okay, on redirect, Mr. Boutros can correct me. Now, uh, let's talk about political power in California. Um, and is it true that Equality California is one of the leading gay rights groups in the state of California? Um, I actually can't really answer that because what, what do you mean by leading gay rights groups? There are a number of groups active. I would assume that Equality California is among the largest, if not the largest, but um, I, I don't have the basis. I don't know the budget of every group in the state. Equality California raised more money for the No on 8 campaign than any other group. Is that right? Uh, that sounds correct, yes. Okay. Now let's turn to tab 35, which is the 2009 legislative scorecard uh, for Equality California. And directing your attention to the first page of text, it says, Despite a tough legislative session and the worst budget crisis in California history, this year has been one of Equality California's best yet in Sacramento. We passed a record 11 pieces of Equality California-sponsored legislation that will improve the lives of LGBT Californias. Is it true that uh, last year there were 11 pieces of legislation passed that uh, were sought by the LGBT community? Um, with the caveat that some of that legislation was in fact non-binding resolutions that were senses of the legislature, then I have no reason to dispute their number. And so this was a good legislative session for the LGBT community, 
correct? Um, I think that that's a, a different question. So what constitutes a good legislative session is whether or not high priority items were in fact uh, acted upon in a positive sense and were ultimately signed uh, into law. Uh, so again, I'd have to know what the rate of bill passage was in all other years, uh, what the number of bills passed in all other years was. Um, I take on, uh, on, on faith that their report that they feel pretty good about it, that they're happy with it. Um, now let's look at their scorecard that they give to different legislators. Uh, if we look at the Senate scorecard, and that's, uh, you just flip the page, um, it has ratings of 100%, and I'll represent to you uh, that 21 out of 40, uh, a majority of the California Senate has a 100% approval rating from Equality California. Is it fair to assume that any state senator who receives a 100% rating from Equality California is an ally of the LGBT community? That would depend on which items were used to score. So for example, um, we might find in a year where there were several sort of procedural um, issues that came up, you could get 100% from a particular representative. And in a subsequent year in which maybe there was a much more uh, contentious issue that came up, you would get less than 100%. So it's important to always keep in mind that the scorecard is relative to what the agenda was in the legislature that year. Some agendas are more vexing than others. Can you point to any of these legislators who received a 100% rating and provide evidence that any of them are not allies of the LGBT community? Again, I don't have the legislature and all of their activities committed to memory. I couldn't possibly. Well, I'm just asking for one. Can you point to one piece of evidence that one of these individuals with a 100% rating is not an ally of the LGBT community? I cannot. I can point to the fact that there's an awful lot of zeros on the page as well, that the minority party, should they gain control of the Senate, would reverse many of the items that you've just identified. All right. All right. Now let's turn to the Assembly scorecard. And again, I'll represent to you that 41 out of the 80, again a majority, have a perfect 100% score. Um, can you point to any evidence that any of these individuals who received a 100% rating were not allies of the LGBT community? Once again, no, I do not have an exhaustive command of the behavior of each legislator. Okay. Um, now, let's look at some other officials in the state of California. Um, it's reasonable to assume that Barbara Boxer was a candidate of choice for gays and lesbians, correct? Um, I, in a general election sense, I think yes. the answer to that is yes. I don't remember the last time she had a meaningful primary challenge, maybe not since 92 when she was first elected. Right, but uh, in her recent elections, she's been a candidate of choice for the gay and lesbian community, correct? Yes. And in Senator Dianne Feinstein's recent elections for U.S. Senate, she's been a candidate of choice for the gay and lesbian community, correct? Um, given the choices that they've been provided, yes. Right. I understand. And um, Attorney General Brown is the candidate of choice to be the next governor of California among gays and lesbians, correct? Well, as we've previously discussed, approximately 77% of uh, self-identified gays and lesbians identify as Democrats, and the last time I checked, he's the only Democrat in the field. So I would assume that approximately 77% have a, a predisposition to support him. Can you identify any general election for statewide office in California in the last 10 years where the LGBT community supported the Republican candidate rather than the Democrat candidate? I cannot. And can you identify any Democrat running for statewide office in California in the last 10 years who won the Democratic primary over the opposition of the LGBT community? Uh, that I'm, ha I'm going to afraid I have to plead ignorance on. I, I lived external to the state from 2001 until 2008, so I wasn't privy to primary politics here. Okay. Now, uh, Senator Boxer is an ally of the gay and lesbian community, correct? I think that's a fair assessment. 
and uh, let's talk about labor unions. Uh, labor unions are part of the coalition, uh, the Democratic coalition in the state of California, correct? That's correct. And you would agree that there have certainly been a number of moments where labor unions supported the gay and lesbian political position on matters of concern to the community, correct? I believe um, a distinction I would want to make is that labor union leaders have supported a variety of issues of concern to the community. You can't think of any instance in the last decade where labor unions have opposed the gay or lesbian community, correct? I cannot think of an instance where labor union leaders have opposed the gay and lesbian community. The, the reason I'm differentiating these things is that there's a difference between a coalition built at the elite level and the mass behavior of, of voters. So while you could probably show me a, an endorsement of no on eight from a particular union, I don't actually know how the rank and file of that union voted in November of 2008. And uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 41. This is a press release uh, produced to us by Equality California, dated October 6, 2008. It's DIX 2502, and, and it says in the first paragraph, the Unite Here International Union on Saturday made a $100,000 uh, presumably contribution uh, to Equality California's No on Proposition 8 Campaign Committee and announced its opposition to Prop 8, which eliminates the right of same-sex couples to marry in California. And then turning to the third paragraph, uh, it says, quote, endorsing the No on 8 campaign is consistent with the long-held positions of this union, close quote, said Cleve Jones. Do you have any reason to doubt that uh, Mr. Jones' statement that supporting the rights of the gay and lesbian community was consistent with uh, Unite Here, the International Union? I don't, and I'm actually not surprised to see Unite Here endorsing the No on 8 campaign. Uh, Unite Here represents both needle trades and hotel and restaurant employees, and gays and lesbians are a somewhat larger percentage of the workforce, uh, particularly in the hotel and restaurant employees union, than they are in many other trade unions, so this is not surprising. Okay, and then if we turn to the last paragraph, there's a statement by Jeff Coors, and he's the executive director of Equality California, is that right? That's correct. And he, he states in the second to last sentence of this press release, this contribution reflects the long-standing relationship the LGBT community has had with our union partners. And that's a fair statement, isn't it? Um, it I presume it's a fair statement of his belief. Well, it's an accurate statement, is it not? Uh, once again, I, I don't know that that's true. I think that um, it's, it's fair to say that union leadership has been supportive of gay and lesbian causes in the state uh, in recent decades, um, and, and Mr. Coors is commenting on that, but you're asking me to say whether or not there's a long-standing relationship between the community and the union's membership. I, I, don't, I don't really know that. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2502. Very well. Wait a minute. Uh, DIX uh, 2502, Your Honor. Very well. DIX 2502. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, now, uh, turning your attention to the next tab, Professor Segura, this is a uh, printout of uh, the union contributions that we pulled off of the California Secretary of State's website. Mm -hmm. uh, if we did our math right, uh, there was $1.7 million worth of contributions uh, by unions to the No on 8 campaign. Do you know of a single union that contributed money to the Yes on 8 campaign? I do not. And does it surprise you that all of the unions that gave were giving to the No on 8 campaign? Um, when you didn't ask me, um, I don't know if any union gave to the Yes on 8 campaign. I, I haven't, you know, I'll come across that. So it's possible that one has. All right. uh, if, if I take as a given that all the union camp contributions went to, to No on 8, it does not surprise me, given the long the longstanding relationship between union leadership on the one hand and the gay and lesbian movement on the other. All right. Well, now let's uh, turn your attention to uh, the next tab in your binder. 
This is a story dated October 26, 2008 from the Sacramento Bee. And if we look at the last uh, line on the page, the last sentence, talks about influential Latinos, including uh, the Los Angeles mayor. And can you help me uh, with the pronunciation, Professor Antonio? Villaraigosa. That's what I meant to say. And leaders of the United Farm Workers Union uh, are spreading the word that Proposition 8 is anti-civil rights. Uh, isn't it true that unions did not confine their support to giving money, but their leadership was also out there actively working to defeat Proposition 8? That's a blanket statement. I don't know of the actual activities of all the union leaders involved in the state of California. I couldn't speak to that. Were there some union leaders who were active? Yes. A active in opposing Proposition 8? That's correct. And you can't identify any union leaders who are actively supporting Proposition 8, correct? No, I can't. If we look at tech companies uh, in California, you would agree that many of the Silicon Valley technology companies express pro-gay positions, correct? Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the Silicon Valley industry has tended to be more pro-civil rights uh, on, on many dimensions, and, and this being one of them. I think that's a fair statement. All right. And large corporations in California have a meaningful degree of political power, correct? Um, they do with respect to the issues that concern them. So, for example, um, we might find that oil companies are particularly influential on environmental regulation, energy uh, pricing, or um, some form of, of uh, emissions control and things such as that. Oil companies are not particularly influential on things like uh, kindergarten policy or classroom size, for example. So we don't identify a group as being powerful, and then they are powerful in all circumstances across all issues. They're powerful with respect to the issues that concern them. I think it would be fair to say that Silicon Valley firms and large corporations are powerful here as they are everywhere in the United States in terms of having lots of lobbyists and making lots of campaign contributions and things such as that. And you're not aware of uh, circumstances in which Silicon Valley technology companies have worked against the interests of gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, I, I, again, I don't, I don't have an exhaustive list of their... Um, of their political behavior over time, I, I don't have an example um, to, to suggest that they haven't been. Okay, now let's, uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 44, which is the 2006 annual report of the Human Rights Campaign. And uh, Beginning to think you're on your, their mailing list. <laughs> My new favorite website. Uh, it's uh, DIX 1328, uh, and it's uh, page 13. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to the last uh, bullet point, and tell me when you're there, sir. I'm there. Okay. It says, big businesses like Microsoft back state legislation that would protect GLBT workers. Plus, more and more businesses are supporting fair-minded legislators working to pass important bills for same-sex couples, as Nike did when it backed a civil unions bill in the Oregon legislature in 2006. Um, do you have any reason to doubt these statements that Microsoft and Nike and other large uh, corporations actively are working uh, for the rights of the LGBT community? Um, I would clarify the statement. So there would be a number of objections I would offer. The first is that, again, this is the advocacy organization speaking at how wonderfully effective they are, uh, which is, of course, in their interest in order to maintain their membership and their contribution base. The second is that the statement itself actually uh, sort of illustrates its internal problem. By saying more and more businesses are supporting fair-minded legislators, what it's suggesting is that there are many businesses that do not. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have any change. If they're suggesting change, we couldn't have a uniform level of support. Um, the third is that it's not clear to me that um, each of these organizations are contributing to those legislators because they support same-sex interests. We would want to investigate that. Um, so those would be the things that I would sort of throw in as a caveat. As a general rule, I would not object to the statement that 
the trend in major businesses has moved from opposition to neutrality to support in a number of instances. I don't have an estimation of what the distribution of that is. Your Honor, uh, we, we've come to a convenient stopping point. I hate to be the one who looks like a slacker here, always suggesting that we take breaks, but... Uh, well, I don't think anyone would make that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if it... Oh, let me ask one question, and then you can follow up if you, if you like to, and uh, then Mr. Boutros also. One question, or perhaps a, a one or two follow-on. Does losing elections or failing to obtain legislation denote political powerlessness to require extraordinary protection against majoritarian political processes? Losing an individual election, in my view, would not, because in the democratic process, someone loses all contests. Um, the initiative process, however, is a little bit different because it is the only circumstance where we put individual rights up to a popular vote. So uh, we have 150 or more incident instances in a decade and a half where anti-discrimination protections are voted on by the population and overturned, uh, even though the legislature or a city council or a county uh, board had granted them. We have uniform um, passage of constitutional amendments to exclude one group of citizens from a civil institution. And uh, that's extraordinary in my view. Now does, would each individual act by itself um, be determinative of whether or not there should be judicial intervention? I would say, just as I said to Mr. Thompson, that an outcome by itself is a piece of information, but we would want to know the context in which it passed. Um, uh, and so if we look at a, the passage of a particular bill in the assembly, if we have the passage of a bill where the majority party votes for it and the minority party votes against it, then we might reasonably expect that should that majority change, we could see a reversal on that. We could contrast that with an outcome which is bipartisan, for example. We can see examples where a legislature passes a bill and the public then files a, an initiative to overturn it. Uh, so I, I would want to look at the range of events rather than a single event. And in my view, when you look at the range of events that have occurred in terms of the you know, public voting directly on questions of gay and lesbian rights, uh, that their, their loss rate suggests that long-standing prejudice against gays and lesbians is shaping what their political opportunities are. Follow-up, Mr. Thompson? No follow-up, Your Honor. Very, very well. Um, then why don't we break to, today at this point? Um, how much longer do you have with uh, Professor Segura? I, I think maybe, you know, an hour and a half more, so it depends on the length of the answers, of course, to some extent. But Well, Perhaps uh, you can uh, do as you've done before and uh, spend some time this evening and hone those questions. I will endeavor to do so, Your Honor. Along. And um, then with that, who do we expect as our witnesses tomorrow? Mr. Boyce? Your Honor, we are, we are working on that. Um, uh, after um, this witness completes, uh, we basically, for the completion of our case, have... Um, probably two witnesses, um, uh, Professor Hewitt and um, Mr. Tam. Um, uh, Professor Hewitt, who is planning to be our next witness, uh, ha has been ill today, and, um, and so uh, can make it tomorrow. We are going to put him on. Uh, otherwise, we are going to go with, um, um, I, I may be pronouncing, it's, it's, it's Herrick. Herrick, yes. Herrick, I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Um, the, um, uh, but um, Professor Herrick is, is the one that is ill. Um, uh, if he is available, um, we would put him on following this witness. Other, other than that, we would put Mr. Tam on. Uh, but those are the two witnesses uh, that we have, and then we have a number of uh, documents to offer before we uh, rest.
Okay. Uh, and after those two witnesses testify, do you plan to present any other live witnesses? Uh, we do not. Those are our, those are our two live witnesses that we plan at the present time. Um, there, there is a there's a possibility that we still may need to call Mr. Prentice to authenticate some materials or one of the other people to authenticate materials. But the only other live witnesses we would be calling would be just for the purposes of, of authentication of documents, which we are hopeful that we're going to be able to work out without the necessity of calling them. I understand that the magistrate judge has, I believe, resolved the matter that uh, was discussed before the break this morning involving um, some of the uh, documents. Um, can counsel inform me what that situation is? I, I cannot, Your Honor, but, I, but somebody Mr. Did. McGill, I think you were involved in uh, that proceeding, were you, Mr. McGill? Yes, Your Honor, I was. Um, the motion to amend the uh, core group order was, uh, as Your Honor indicated, was uh, granted in part and denied in part, and the defendant interveners have produced, uh, and we are currently reviewing all of the documents that they were withholding pursuant to that uh, motion to amend that they had made. Is it the plaintiff's intention to introduce um, some of those documents in their case in chief? Obviously, Your Honor, we're reviewing the documents to see, but 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 it is. Um, our, our intention to um, uh, introduce some of those if we can uh, resolve authentication issues uh, before we rest. Right. Well, uh, then it's is it unduly optimistic to think that the plaintiff may rest tomorrow? Your Honor, I think it would be optimistic. Um, uh, I think it is possible, but I think it would be optimistic. I think it is certain we will rest uh, before the end of the day on Friday. Um, but um, uh, I think that with, with the documents that we're still getting and um, uh, sort of working on parallel tracks, I think it will be challenging uh, to finish tomorrow. But we're, we still think that's a possibility. All right. Well, um, then that means that um, under a very optimistic scenario, the defendants may be called upon to begin their case tomorrow, and if not, uh, in all probability on Friday. Yes, Your Honor. We'll have uh, Professor Ken Miller ready to go, Your Honor. Uh, we'd expect a Friday morning. So. Very well. All right. Any uh, housekeeping matters we Your need to attend to? Just one issue to update the court on. The magistrate did um, deny the motion to quash that, denied the motion to quash that was filed by um, uh, Pastor Garlow and Pastor McPherson. So that was the other issue that he was addressing. All right. Well, unless that's brought here, well, that should be the end of that matter. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well, counsel. I'll see you bright and early tomorrow at 8:30. Thank you, Your Honor. Bye.